Hello, my name is Glenn Hall and today is November 14th, 2019. This is part 17 of the mystery of the beast. These videos that I'm doing, I'm doing in order to bring spiritual revelation and understanding to the people of God. We need to understand that there is a difference between the natural and the spiritual, and that it's only the spiritual mind that is going to discern the things that I'm saying and that I have said over the last 16 videos. I want to really drum that home today. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Reading from that, Paul said this, Yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom, a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. We are witnessing the passing away of the rulers of this age right now. But we, that is we prophets, we apostles, impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. Before the ages, decreed before the ages, God spoke these things before time began. And he spoke these things for our glory. Don't be afraid of the word glory. The purpose of God is to bring many sons to glory. And we need to understand that. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They would not have crucified Jesus Christ because he is the one who brings us to glory. They were, they were crucifying their own means to glory, to fruitfulness, to peace. But as it is written, what no eye has seen nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. And that is the reality and the truth for all of us. We simply cannot imagine. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. This is saying that we cannot begin to understand the thoughts of God unless the Spirit of God communicates with us, communicates with our spirits. That's why we received an earnest of the Holy Spirit so that we could communicate with God when we believed in Jesus Christ. Now we, we who have believed, have received not the Spirit of the world. The Spirit of the world is the Spirit of Satan. The whole world has experienced that. The whole world lives in darkness except for those who have now received the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Paul spoke as the Holy Spirit led him to speak. That's what he's saying here. He didn't just suddenly begin to make up things to try to convince people about the reality of God, but God literally spoke through Paul by his Spirit, and therefore he was speaking spiritual truths in words that were taught by the Spirit. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. I know in my life it's been very difficult to find like-minded people to find friends who 
understand the things that God teaches me and the things that God has shown me, who understand the things that I have taught. Fortunately, the Lord gave me a wife who does, and he has taught both of us together over a period now of more than 41 years. And when he leads one of us into truth, into a new truth, he shows the other one so that we are always a double witness to one another, so that we can keep ourselves grounded in truth, grounded in the word. But God will take us to some new idea, and suddenly we see that idea everywhere in Scripture. The prophecies of God will always be confirmed by other scriptures, and you'll be able to find that idea in other places in the Word of God if, in fact, it is a true doctrine. Verse 15, the spiritual person, the word is actually man, the spiritual man judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? Who understands the mind of the Lord in order to be able to instruct a spiritual man? Those who have the mind of Christ. Let's go to Revelation 11 now. Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, Rise and measure the temple of, the, of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out. For it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. During the course of writing this mystery of the beast, I've come to believe that this 1260 days is an undefined period of time as far as the actual time. God doesn't tell us the actual amount of time so that we can't just go figure out what day this is going to end. <clears throat> But it's a number that relates to the entire time that the people of God preach the truth to the world. It relates to the entire time that the overcomers of God preach the truth to the world. Notice in these verses, verse 2 and 3, you have 42 months mentioned, and then you have 1260 days mentioned. Those are the very same amounts of time. There are 1,260 days in 42 30-day months. That's also the same amount of time as a time times and half a time, which is commonly interpreted to mean a year, two years, and half of a year, three and a half years. Three and a half years is 42 months. Likewise, three and a half years is 1,260 days. I believe that that's the entire time that God's two witnesses have spoken his truth to an unbelieving world. I think there are some of God's overcomers who, for some reason or other, have not had a second witness who was with them. But I have been fortunate to have had a second witness with me for my entire adult life, and that's my wife. Now, we have spoken the truth, and we've spoken the truth to many people, but typically that truth is rejected. Almost always, almost always that truth is rejected. These two witnesses are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. 
And if anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. We have to think spiritually. Is John saying that literal fire pours forth from the mouth of the two witnesses in order to kill people? Is that what he's saying? No. And let's go to a scripture to confirm that. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah 23 is an absolutely profound chapter of the Bible. Verse 28. Let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream, but let him who has my word speak my word faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat, declares the Lord? Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. Is not my word like fire? So here we come. Revelation 11.5, And if anyone would harm my two witnesses, fire pours forth from their mouth. That's the word of God. Consuming their foes. Have you ever been in the presence of a true prophet, of someone who actually speaks the word of God? You can be stricken to the quick. You can suddenly, you are naked before them. They see you. They know you. They understand you. They discern you. And then going on prophetically and spiritually, they have the power to shut the, shut the sky, that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit, the beast that rises from the abyss, who is that? We first saw him in Revelation chapter 13, but he's showing up here in Revelation 11. The beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them, and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. This video is called The Great City. The beast that rises from the abyss is the beast that rises from the sea. It's man. Man who is ridden by Babylon the Great, the satanic spirit. And that is the beast that always kills God's prophets always kills God's prophets. Something that has been happening practically since the, be well, since the beginning of time. It has. Because Cain killed Abel. Abel was a prophet. So the first two men, of the first two, one of the men killed the other. And one of the, man, one of the men represents Babylon the Great. And the other represents the two witnesses, or the prophet of God. Now to show you that, let's go to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew 23 is incredibly powerful, starting at the very beginning. Jesus rebuked the scribes and Pharisees. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. 
So do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach, but they do not practice. So then he goes on. Oh, here we go. We talked about the mark of God and the mark of the beast recently. And here he talks about how they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, trying to show that they are obeying the law, putting scripture in their phylacteries that are on their heads. And yet the whole purpose of the law of that scripture from Deuteronomy was that they would write the law upon their hearts and their minds and that the law would become part of them. Not that they make a show of having the law on their heads. See, the law was only something natural for them. And so they began to come up with all kinds of loopholes and things, ways to get out of, of obeying the law, obeying the heart of the law. And let me give you a, a funny example that things that Christians do today. I recently heard this story. Someone is renting a house from an Amish family in Pennsylvania. And this particular Amish sect, they're Christians. You know, and how many sects of Christians are there? How many different churches are there? Thousands, thousands. And all are wrong in many, many doctrines. So here's just another example of a church that's wrong in doctrine. So they have a doctrine that they cannot have electricity in their homes. So one Amish family rents a home to someone else, you know, to someone who's not a member of their church. And it has electricity in it, of course, because they couldn't rent the house if it didn't. So what this Amish family does is with these new tenants, they always get an agreement that the Amish can run a cable, an electric cable from that home to power their freezers, to keep their meat, to keep it from spoiling. Now, isn't that an interesting way to get around obeying the law? And yet that's what the Pharisees did all the time. And that's what every Christian group does too. Every Christian group has their own sets of law. It may even be an evil set, you know, but it is, they will have their own laws and you better abide by those laws if you're going to remain a person in good standing in that church. Believe me. For they preach, but they do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi or being called teacher or being called pastor or being called minister or being called bishop, or being called pope, or being called teacher, or being called prophet, or being called apostle, whatever it is. Everyone loves to be called by this grand spiritual name, but it's rubbish in the eyes of God. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. I forgot that. You have all the fathers in the Catholic Church. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus is the Christ. He is the one teacher. You have one teacher. You have one instructor. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. For you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte, and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Woe to you. I don't kind of stop here. 
churches do the same thing. We go on our grand mission trips. We go to Africa. We go to Asia. We go to Russia. We teach them what we think is the truth. And we make them twice as much a child as hell of hell as we are. Because the fact of the matter is, most of us don't know the truth. We simply don't know the truth. Because we don't sit quietly with God. We don't sit quietly with Christ and humbly pray, come sit a while with me. Teach me your ways. Show me your ways. Let me see wonderful things in your law. Woe to you blind guides who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? They had it exactly opposite because they worshiped mammon. They worshiped gold. And many of you today, you're storing up gold. You're storing up silver for that great crash that is coming. And here's how you know the false prophets. They're always trying to sell you gold and silver. They're always trying to sell you something. But you need to buy the truth. And you say, if someone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if someone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred. So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. Faithfulness is truth in the scripture. You tithe meticulously and yet you neglect the weighty matters of the law. The weighty matters of the law are justice and mercy and truth. Justice and mercy. Justice and righteousness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside... They are full of greed and self-indulgence, you blind Pharisee. First clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. What's he talking about? Jesus always spoke in parables. They look good on the outside. And so many of us are always concerned about how we look on the outside. But how do we look on the inside? What is the inside of ourselves really like? What does our soul look like? Is our soul light, full of light? Or is our soul full of darkness? What do we feed ourselves with? What are we full of? What are we watching? What are we listening to? What are we saying? What are we doing? We clean the outside. We look good on the outside. What about our insides? Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. This 
is the leaven of the Pharisees. Hypocrisy and lawlessness. Hypocrisy and sin is the leaven of the Pharisees. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Thus you witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your fathers. Okay, fill up then. What's he saying? Kill me. And that's exactly what they did. Right? The very week that he spoke this to the, pro- to the scribes and the Pharisees, they killed Jesus. You serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? These people are the sons of their father, Satan. Today in this world, Many, many are sons of Satan and do not realize it. Many think that they're sons of God, but they're sons of Satan. Therefore, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel, killed by his brother Cain, to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Now I want you to pay particular attention to this. Jesus says that all the righteous blood shed on earth from the day, from the time of creation, from the time of the murdering of Abel until then was attributable to these scribes and Pharisees. And then Jesus says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you shall not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Notice how Jesus goes from a condemnation of the scribes and the Pharisees to a condemnation of Jerusalem. The city that kills. Suddenly, Jesus went from the people who killed to the city that kills. And now let's look again at Revelation 11. The two witnesses, when, they're, when they finish their testimony, the beast that rises from the abyss will make war on them and overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. Well, where was the Lord crucified? Jerusalem. So if I ask you, what is the great city? You'll probably answer Jerusalem. And you would be right. But that's not the only answer because it's also symbolically, spiritually. The Greek word is spiritually. So spiritually, this city is called Sodom. What does Sodom represent? Sexual sin, 
Sodom, sexual sin. And Egypt, what does Egypt represent? Slavery. Sexual sin, slavery, Jerusalem, crucifixion, so murder, the great city. But is that all? Are there other names for the great city? Now remember in Revelation chapter 17, I introduced you to the beast that was being ridden by the harlot. And also revealed to you that that beast is described as the eighth head of the beast later on and identified that as President Trump. But then as we go to the end of that chapter, we see this. And the angel said to me, the waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the pro prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. Now, I've heard many people claim that Jerusalem, old Jerusalem over in the current land of Israel, is the city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. We have to stop thinking in the natural. We have to think spiritually. This great city is a spiritual city. And now in chapter 18, we are going to learn a lot about this spiritual city. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. And the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. Two things, two main things to see here concerning her sins. Sexual immorality and luxurious living. Trade. Trade. Babylon the Great teaches her people to worship mammon. She raises up traders, T-R-A-D-E-R-S, that in the Old Testament are called Canaanites. Canaanites are traitors. Israel was given the land of Canaan to judge those people who had given themselves to all of these sins. Babylon the Great is a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, and birds usually represent unclean spirits, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. Okay. So she is filled with the demonic. Babylon the Great is the satanic, demonic spirit that rules the world, that has ruled the world until now. That spirit rode the beast 
That spirit controlled the kings of the empires that have ruled the world until now. And now we have a king called a president, the eighth head of the beast, who is throwing Babylon the Great off of his back, off of the back of the beast. That's what's happening now. That's why we see such incredible chaos right now. Now think about everything that Donald Trump is exposing. Have you ever seen so many arrests for pedophilia? Have you ever seen so many arrests for sex trafficking? Have you ever heard such gross stories of taking children from their parents into places of satanic worship and sacrifice and sexual, satanic sexual activity? Find Liz Crokin on YouTube. I believe it's spelled C-R-O-K-I-N. And listen to some of her accounts concerning the incredibly evil events dealing with sex trafficking that have occurred in this nation, rampantly occurred. Jeffrey Epstein got a slap on the wrist under Obama. He was murdered under, because he was arrested again under the Trump administration. The dark secrets of Jeffrey Epstein will continue to come out for a long time. And he is the prime example of showing the sexual immorality. It says, verse 3 says, All nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. All nations. And the kings of the earth committed immorality with her. So the king, so it's no surprise, is it, that we hear things about Prince Andrew going to Epstein's island. It's no surprise when we hear that presidents like Clinton went there. Babylon the Great corrupted the entire earth. The entire earth has lived under the dominion of Babylon the Great from the beginning. God has ordained now to be the time when the world finally breaks free from the slavery that we have been in to Babylon the Great. I want to take you back to Revelation chapter 11, where we saw the two witnesses. The two witnesses are always killed. God's people, the overcomers, their voices are always shut down or else they are actually physically martyred and killed throughout the history of the world. All of the overcomers... This period of time, in fact, both the Old Testament times and the New Testament times have been for God to bring the overcomers into maturity. It has not been the time for the great worldwide revival to occur yet, but that is coming. But after... Oh, this is interesting. I'll start at nine. For three and a half days, some from the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in, tomb, in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. My wife once mentioned that she sees that this could have been the beginning of Santa Claus, the beginning of giving all of the presents at the pagan holiday that we call Christmas. 
because that began long ago. And look how perverted Christmas has become today. But after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood up on their feet, and great fear fell on all those who saw them. This is the resurrection of the dead, the first resurrection, the resurrection of the first fruits, the overcomers. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. And at that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed. Behold, the third woe is soon to come. We are just about here. The resurrection has not occurred yet. The glorification is going to come. It has to come for the kingdom of God to come to the earth. The third woe that is coming is the day of wrath. The third, war that, the third woe that is coming is going to be characterized by the takedown, the total destruction of Babylon the Great. And we're going to read about that next time, and I'm going to take you to other scriptures that also talk about that and show you how... This is spoken of in a multitude of scriptures. But we'll just finish now with this bit from chapter 11, because look what happens. Right after it, it says the third woe is coming, we have this. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet. So the third woe is coming. The seventh angel blows his trumpet. And there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. The third woe. The third woe is brought by the sons of God. The third woe is brought by the overcomers. The third woe is the rod of iron. The third woe is the application of the law of God in this world. The third woe is getting rid of this rampant sin and debauchery that has practically destroyed our entire earth. The third woe is the establishment of God's kingdom. It's only a woe from the perspective of those who serve Satan because that is who the woe is directed at. The wrath of God is directed at the people of Satan. God's people were not appointed for wrath. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God saying, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged, and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened and the Ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. Father, we pray for your kingdom to come. We pray for this time to come. We pray for the rule of Christ to come and for your overcomers, for the sons of God to be revealed and to rule with Christ in righteousness and justice. In Jesus' name we pray, Lord. Amen.